you have your Bibles, would you turn to the book of Colossians in the New Testament? Let me remind you to turn your clocks back, I understand, next week. If not, you'll get here an hour early, I guess. So try to remind yourself of that. Um, We're going to be looking again in Colossians, beginning in chapter 2 and verse 4 in just a moment. Um, A few years ago, I was studying about uh, the most poisonous uh, creatures on the face of the earth. It sort of intrigues me. When I was young, I was the one that would always look in the encyclopedia. That's back in the days for y'all who are young. And look at pictures of king cobras and black black mambas and all of those and were impressed by it. But it is very interesting that one of the most venomous creatures on the face of the earth is really an unsuspecting uh, creature. It's called a marble cone snail. It is more venomous than the king cobra. It is more venomous than most of the most poisonous creatures on the earth that made the top 35 list that I read online. In fact, it's number five in uh, most poisonous creatures on the earth. It's found only in the Indian Ocean, so that's good for you uh, unless you make a trip to that part of the world. But this species of snail is very small and it's very beautiful. I was reading that in 1650 Rembrandt, because of its unique and intriguing design, actually took to the task of painting a marble coal snail. And But don't be deceived. This creature, this mullox, pass, packs enough venom to kill 20 human beings with one injection. It's small, it's intriguing and beautiful in color. It actually would be considered uh, innocuous just to look at it, but in reality, it's very harmful and and deadly. You know, throughout the New Testament, God warns the original readers and us through Jesus' words and through the various epistles of the dangers of false teachers. These are those who would appear to be innocuous. In fact, they would appear uh, to be wise. They would uh, in many ways have attractive speech and, and present what might be considered plausible arguments. But Jesus said that they will come as wolves in sheep's clothing. He said elsewhere that they were whitewashed tombs. The Apostle Paul speaks of them as casting spells on inattentive people and as being a people accursed. The the Apostle Peter, he said uh, in 2 Peter, they're like springs without water, uttering empty and boastful words. And then Jude, in that uh, penultimate book of the Bible, adds to their description when he writes that they're like dangerous reefs. Uh, like rocks, large rocks lying beneath the water that can do terrible damage to uh, a ship. And so as we see all of these descriptions, I began to think how many books in the New Testament speak about false teaching. I was saying, man, it's probably has to be at least 13 of the 27, but I found that 26 of 27 books in the New Testament at some point speak to the issue of false teaching. That says something, that God considers it important enough that in well over 90% of uh, the, in fact, more than 95% of the books in the New Testament, Uh, He included warnings about such teachers. Seemingly innocent false teachers can easily enter a church or community and before one knows it bring considerable harms to those who are in its effects. One of the 26 books in the New Testament that addresses the issue of false teaching is the book that we're studying, Colossians. We noted a couple of weeks ago that one of the main purposes for Paul writing this epistle to the Colossians, in fact, one of the three main purposes was this, that he would address the threat of false teaching and its potential impact negatively on the church at Colossae. Look with me uh, at Colossians 2 and verse 4. He says, I'm saying this so that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable. 
for I may be absent in body, but I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see how well ordered you are and the strength of your faith in Christ. So then just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. And you have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority. You were also so circumcised in him with a circumcision done not with hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ when you were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead and when you were dead in tres trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses he erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. Let's pray. Father, as we um, continue this study in Colossians, we thank you, Lord, for the warnings in scripture. Lord, we know that whenever you warn us, it's an act not only to give us wisdom, but it's an act from your love for us, your mercy toward us. And so uh, as we look at uh, Paul's description of both the characteristics and the impact of these false teachers, Lord, we pray through your word that you would give us wisdom, that we might be alert to uh, these potential threats. And Lord, we're not immune to it. We're not immune to people trying to come to us to seek to distort the word in our hearts and minds. Lord, protect us, give us wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. It's very interesting here that after speaking about the centrality of Jesus Christ, which we looked at last week in the greatness of Jesus Christ, how God in the flesh is Jesus and the works that Jesus did, the superiority of Jesus that Paul follows in this text this morning by speaking uh, about the threat of false teaching. And as we'll see today, this false teaching really centered upon what people were teaching wrong about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And so we see in this epistle that he is contrasting Christ-centered biblical theology against the ungodly philosophy of this day. And so, you know, as Paul was writing here and elsewhere in the New Testament when other writers and when Jesus spoke about the issue of false teaching, they were speaking in the context of that time. But the fact that we have the very word of God helps us to understand that it applies to us also today. Because we know even today there are individuals who would threaten the true doctrine of the Bible, specifically would present a Jesus who is not what we understand understand to be the true Jesus. We can hear it over the radio airways. We can see it online. We can see it in television. The scripture tells us that we need to be aware, that we need to be alert, that we need to understand uh, what the Bible teaches, understand that and not waver from it. And we're going to look uh, next time that I'm with you in the next couple of weeks further into this subject of false teaching. But today I want to begin by, by looking back over these verses that we just read and, and noting three characteristics of false teaching addressed in our text. And the first is this, it is deceitful at its core. False teaching is deceitful. In other words, someone who is either duped by that or who is a perpetrator of that, they're not going to come and say, I'm teaching you something that is wrong. They're not going to say, probably even, I'm teaching you something that you've never heard before. Often it comes in deception. Look at what it says in uh, chapter 2 and verse 4 where, where Paul begins our, our text today. He said, I'm saying this so that no one will what? Deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable or 
plausible. They seem that way, but they really are not. And then he follows in verse 8, later in our text, he says, be careful. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy, that is the philosophy of men, and empty what? Deceit based on human tradition. In the first usage, we see uh, the verb usage of deceive. Don't let anyone deceive you. And that translates uh, the Greek word paralegizatai, which literally means to reason falsely. Don't let someone reason falsely with you contradicting uh, the true gospel. And then in the second usage, it's actually a different root word, but in our English, it is translated deceit in the noun form. It's the Greek word apates, and it is closely related to a word which means to beguile or to give a false impression. And so Paul begins where we're reading today, and twice he speaks of form, forms of the word deceit, and he is saying, be alert, be careful, uh, be aware. And we need to make no mistake of this, and listen to me, the source of false teaching is none other than Satan himself. The book of Revelation depicts Satan as a great dragon. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, it says, so the great dragon, that is symbolic of Satan, is cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan. And he qualifies that by saying, who deceives the world. So we see in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, he has known the great dragon as a deceiver. But we can go all the way back to the garden. We can go to the beginning of the Bible. And what did he do? He deceived Adam and Eve. Did God really say, or God knows in the day that you eat of this tree, you'll be like him, knowing good and evil. And so he is deceptive in his work. And so this teaching, the source of all false teaching is Satan himself. And the culprits are charlatans or misinformed uh, people who carry that message to other people. Well, notice the, the goal of that or the end result or desire of that. He says, be careful that no one takes you captive. This is a picture that carries the idea of kidnapping. If we were to kidnap or see someone kidnap, that person would be taken from one position and moved into another position, to a position uh, where one should be, to a position where one should not be. And so it's that idea of moving. And what was happening, there were obviously individuals who were in Colossae, who were well grounded in the faith, but Paul felt it important to write, be careful of those who would seek you to move from a position of right doctrine, in a sense, given that picture of kidnapping and moving you into a position of wrong doctrine. And so what does he say? Be careful. Be careful. Keep your head on a swivel. Uh, don't imagine that you'll be immune to this. Don't think that you cannot be duped. Be careful. And so we see that human philosophy with a smile can come in and it can appear so good and so pretty, just like that, that intriguing uh, marble cone snail, but its end can lead to destruction. And so how does that apply to us today? Everything that we read, everything that we hear, we need to filter through the true doctrine of Scripture, especially in all of the Scripture, but especially uh, the devil likes to deceive in the area of who Christ is and what he's done. And we'll see that in a moment. But the first thing is that uh, false teaching is deceitful at its core. We don't have to wonder that. The second thing, it is divisive in its effect. God is a God of order. It tells us that in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 33. However, in contrast to that, Satan is a worker of disorder. Think about Satan and his work, if you want to put quotes, because it was a bad work in the Garden of Eden. What did he do? He tried to introduce disorder. The world was in perfect order. Uh, Adam and Eve were in right relationship to each other. They were in right relationship uh, to God. And then what did he do? He said, um, did God really say that? And he said, in the day that you uh, eat of it, you'll become like him. And so he began to immediately uh, 
divide one against the other. He tr tried to divide them against God. You don't understand God. You, you're distorted in regard uh, to what God is saying. And so we see that. But not only was there division there, but there was division between Adam and Eve. In other words, once they were found guilty, they began to defend themselves. And so Adam said, what? The woman you gave to me, God, she is the one who gave me of this. And so he was blaming God, but he was also blaming Eve. And so what was in a world of perfect order, the devil came in and tried to bring disorder. And do not be deceived. In a community, in a church, in a family, the devil's desire is to do that same thing. Now, Paul was not physically present here in Colossae. That's why he was writing. He, he was separated from them. And so in, in verse 5, uh, we see that he says, I may be absent in body. In other words, I'm not physically with you, but I am with you in spirit. Uh, he wasn't there, but in spirit he was with them. He said, rejoicing to see how well ordered you are and the strength of your faith in Christ. We've all heard the saying, when the cat's away, the mice will play, or when the, when the head teacher is out, the substitute teacher can be manipulated. And what Paul is saying here is, is I'm apart from you, but don't be deceived. Even though I'm apart from you, I'm still with you because I can hear what those teachers were coming in. Paul doesn't care about you, trying to divide. Don't, don't follow what he's saying. And deceitfully, they're trying to place uh, question and doubt into people. Uh, there's a movement in the day uh, that we're living in the days called deconstructionism and people will come in and try to lead people to, to, and they will seek to undermine and question and bring doubt to all that one has believed. God's word is saying, stay the course. Don't be divided. Don't be severed from that. And so Paul is saying here, I'm rejoicing to see what, how well ordered you are and the strength of your faith in Christ. In other words, he was hoping they would continue to be and he was commending them for it. It would be much like if we had a child and we wanted that child to behave well, we went in a public place. We'll say, boy, you're such a well-behaved child and you're believing it, you say it, they were well-behaved at home and you're saying, and by the way, you're gonna be well-ordered when we get in public. And so this compliment that Paul is saying, he's saying, I have confidence in you that you're well-ordered because these people are trying to divide and get you into disorder, stay in the strength of your faith in Christ. You know, there are many ways that Satan can seek to divide the church, even over the color of a carpet, over personal conflicts, over differences of opinions, and even seemingly good things. But know this, one of the main ways that he seeks to divide the church is by introducing wrong teaching. And we need to be alert. We need to be alert to that because false teaching is divisive in its effect. But I want you to see finally, it is divergent in its path. It's divergent in its intended path. And I want to sit down on this. This will be a longer point than the other two, but stay with me. We're going to move through a lot of things. But notice what it says uh, in our text in, in verse 6. He says, continue to walk in him. See the relationship to Christ. Him is Christ. In verse 7, he says, you're to be rooted and built up again in him. In verse 10, he says, and you've been filled by him who is the head. And then in verse 11, he mentions, you were also circumcised in him. In verse 12, he adds to that, you were buried with him. Again, speaking about Jesus. In verse 13, he says, and when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive, what? With him. And so throughout uh, these verses of the latter part of our text, he's saying you're in him, you're connected to him, you're built up in him, you're with him, you've been circumcised in him, buried with him, alive with him. And so it doesn't take a Rhodes Scholar for us to understand that the threat of the false teaching dealt with the person of Christ, the work of Christ. That's what these individuals were trying to do. And so in verse 6, basically what he's saying is stay the path, continue the walk in him. Continue that walk as you have received Christ, continue in him. 
Andy Pippinger was a friend of mine who uh, lived in East Tennessee. I actually roomed with his brother uh, when I uh, went to a seminary the, the second semester that I was there. His brother was the worst cook I've ever eaten. He <laughs> cooked chicken one time and had no flavor at all. It was so bad we threw the chicken out in the bush and even the dogs wouldn't eat it. That's how bad a cook he was. But his brother Andy was a bright guy. He went to uh, Rhodes University in Memphis, and I believe on scholarship, academic scholarship, brilliant mind. Very long and athletic, Andy was, this, this brother of, of my former roommate. And so we were at Camp Cherokee one year, and we used to have Olympics and races and stuff. And part of the events the last day, because you represented your tribe, uh, you would have various competition. Luke and Charlie, they won the canoeing when they went. And we were very proud the state of Virginia was represented well. But this particular year, part of the entire activities was a race. You had to run uh, a mile and a half or two through a wooded area and come back. Now, Andy was fast, and he took off like a streak. The problem was Andy was the first one in line, so there was no one to look and follow to know which way to go. He got lost somewhere in the wooded area. He finished 15 minutes after the last person finished. Some reason he was running around in the wooded area and finally found his way. Paul is saying here, stay the course. Don't get distracted. Keep your bearings. And, and Andy, he may not have had it because he was the first one in the race. He may have been lost. But you and I, we have the word of God as our guide. We can, we can study the scripture. We can understand. And so Paul is saying, stay to the course. And he adds to that in verse 7. Being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. So he moves from staying on a course, a walking course or a running course, uh, to that of staying true to one's roots. And, and when it says here um, that you're to be rooted, it's the perfect tense and it and carries this idea, staying permanently rooted. In other words, you were rooted, don't uproot yourselves, stay where you are. No variance. And he says, being built up and established in the faith. In other words, you're rooted there, but be continually built up, be continually established, connected to the faith. Now, faith there is not a subjective uh, thing, but it is the faith, the Christian faith. You, you realize there is a true Christian faith that we're called to stay to, and we're not to allow people to distort or to add to or to take from that. But it's something he adds very interesting in verse 7 that jumped out at me this week, overflowing with gratitude. You think we're talking here false teaching. We're talking of all of this. Well, if someone tries to deceive or to divide us, what are they trying to do? They're trying to move us and influence us in their direction. You know what? It's a lot easier to move someone who's not content. And so what he is saying here, maintain your gratitude, be thankful for what the Lord has done, rehearse what the Lord has done, be, have a, 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 a attitude of being thankful. And if we're thankful, we're not going to follow after the temptations to fall into wrong teachers. And so in verse eight, he moves on. Be careful that no one takes you captive. Again, this idea of moving you, following the elements of this world. And the elements of this world was set against uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's humanism today that will do the same thing. In fact, there's a group uh, uh, called Unitarianism. You've probably heard of it. And, and in this church, they do not adhere to the deity of Christ. I was reading even this morning, one writer proudly said that he had come to the conclusion of the deification of Jesus Christ. And so what they try to do is ungod uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are groups that would do that today. The Jehovah's Witness do the same thing. Uh, they say that Jesus is not the God, but an emanation of God. So those people who knock on your doors that may have a smile, that may seem to be really smart, that you may hide behind the curtains because you realize they've rehearsed for an hour and you're probably painting uh, the house or working on something and have no idea what they're doing and they're trying to bring you into that, just understand this, they do not believe 
the, the sound teaching of Jesus Christ. Uh, Mormons the same way. Mormons many times has become like a charlatan. Uh, they they, they uh, uh, become like a chameleon rather. They begin to change what they're thought. They had uh, teachings that they believed 20 or 30 years to go, uh, 30 years ago, uh, like polygamy and stuff like that. They adjust and they adapt because they're moving and they're moving. But do you realize what they teach? They teach that if you will be faithful enough in their doctrine, in their way of life, that you can be like Jesus over another world. So you wonder why do they ride around in bicycles? Because they're thinking, boy, they're working, 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 working. And, and, and these people, uh, they're part of, of, of this world, uh, but the terrestrial world. We're going to be a part of the celestial world, and we're going to be there. You know what all that does? It brings down Christ. It brings down Christ. So we need to understand what a group teaches about Jesus. If it is deviating from what the, <clears throat> the Bible teaches about Jesus, we need to avoid it with all of our energy. <clears throat> so Paul, as he's writing to the Colossians here, he's reminding them of their connectivity to Christ, being baptized in Christ. Don't, you, you believed Christ. What I preached, what Epaphras preached, you believed what, uh, what was presented to you. Don't move away from it. Stay in him. And so we see here in, in verse 9, he adds to it, for the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. That says full in entirety that Jesus is fully God. He is, uh, he is God in the flesh when he was on this earth and he is God eternity past and eternity future. He is above every ruler, it says in verse 10. You've put on Christ. He was their circumcision. In other words, the, the, the false teachers of, of the Jewish element would say you must be circumcised. And basically what he's saying here is Jesus' broken body for you is what you need, not the broken body of your circumcision. You were recipients of the broken body of Christ Stay in him. You know, years ago, uh, I had another friend. This guy happened to be in Tennessee, too. You're saying you got too many friends in Tennessee. Well, I married somebody from Tennessee. Some of the funniest people I met were from Tennessee. Hilarious. They had this one guy they called Hybrid. That was his nickname. I said, why do you call him Hybrid? Because he's trying to act like his brother and his brother's best friend. And so you would see him if his brother talked a certain way. The next day, the little brother would talk the same way. If the friend said something, the, the, he would say something to the friend. And so they just called him Hybrid. What Paul is warning here is against a hybrid teaching. There were elements of Jewish legalism in it of people who were trying to promote circumcision, asceticism, all of these things that a devout Jew that did not know Jesus would present. But there also was this early form of what later would become Gnosticism that would seek to deny uh, the physical body of Jesus Christ because he said all matters evil. How in the world could God uh, be matter? Could become flesh if matters evil. Well, I'll tell you why. Because your doctrine's wrong, Gnostics, early Gnostics. It's wrong. It is a deceiving doctrine that source is not the scripture. And so here uh, we see that they were attacking the person and the work of Christ, these people who threatened the church. And going back, though, to our opening illustration of this marble cone snail, we say, well, with this snail, how can I be sure that I'm safe from it? Well, first, if you're not in the Indian Ocean, you're okay, all right? Secondly, if that thing looks ugly and, it, and it's, and it's uh, purple and blue or whatever, and it doesn't have that combination of black and orange and white, you're okay. In other words, you have a point uh, of reference. You can know, uh, I'm okay if I'm this. And so as we know the Bible and what the Bible teaches about Jesus, then we know we're okay. But if we get off the Bible and begin to listen to current philosophy or people who would question the Bible or this, then we're in danger. 
You see, Jesus is Lord. Not only was he crucified uh, for them, in verse 12 of our text it said he was raised from the dead. They identified with Jesus in his baptism. And so we get a great and true theology in these uh, first two chapters that we saw last week and this week. Jesus is the creator, uh, verse 16. He is the sustainer of the created order. He is the head of the church, not the pastor nor the deacons. He is the true God, 115, we saw last week, and verse 9 of our chapter today. He is the reconciler, and if anyone is teaching these things consistent one after the other, we're in safe water. But if people begin to move out of that, then we're in dangerous water. And there's another thing. He is the giver and bestower of life. Notice what it says in verses 12 and 13. You were buried with him in baptism when you identified. And baptism was his death as we died ourselves. You're raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Jesus is the one who is victor over life. And when you were dead in your trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. We can go on and on because Paul is going on on and on, that he is the savior, that he is the sustainer, that he is the creator, that he is head of the church, that he died and he died uh, for us on our behalf, that he was raised from the dead. Words can't describe all Jesus is, but it's so important that we don't move off course, that we understand biblically who Jesus is. You know, false teaching, we need to be aware because it's deceitful at its core. It comes in a persuasive and attractive way. It's divisive in its effect, in its nature. It, it tends to separate not only man from God, but often it can divide churches. It's deviant in its path. You know, I performed one baptism in my life in the Indian River. I didn't know about the marble cone snail at that time. I just walked. I was more worried what would happen in an Islamic country um, than I was worried, and that was above the water than what was under the water. But if I had read about the marble cone snail, I promise you I would have really analyzed that situation before I went in the water. But God protected me in my ignorance. But we can't depend on such protection when it comes to the word of God and true doctrine. That's why God gives us texts like we read today, so that we have the warning signs, so that we know. That's why 26 of the 27 books in the New Testament at some point address it, so that we won't be ignorant. But it's, our, it's imperative, it's imperative that we take seriously, we take seriously the warnings and that we devote ourselves to understanding what true doctrine is. And when we hear something that sounds strange, that will many times is the Holy Spirit saying, whoa, don't go there. Let's pray. Father, Paul didn't give idle warnings in the scripture whenever he gave a warning, whenever Lord Jesus gave a warning as in regard to false teachers, it gives credence to the fact that they do exist. They existed in biblical times. They exist today. In fact, Lord, their influence could be even greater today through the technology that we have, through the airwaves, through the internet, through the television. Lord, there are many people like that marble cone snail. They may seem innocuous. They may seem even attractive, even intriguing. But Lord, as your word tells us, they're very dangerous. And so Lord, protect us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who guides us into truth and, and warns us. We thank you for your word that helps us to understand the person and work of Jesus Christ. Lord, we saw last week he's matchless. There's none like he is. 
because he's full of God. We see that again today. Lord, protect us, protect our families for those who would distort the, the true teaching of the gospel. And Lord, as people work so hard to deceive, I pray that we would work even harder to share the truth with our friends, our family, our co-workers, our classmates. And we lift this prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I don't know how God has spoken to you in your life in the last few weeks. Uh, you and God know that. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Wouldn't you do that today? The Lord Jesus Christ, who the scripture said is head of the church, is the sustainer of all things, the creator God, eternal, fully God, fully man when he was on this earth. The one who died for you, who rose again and gives eternal life. Wouldn't you say, God, I'm a sinner. I need you in my life. I turn from my sin and trust in you. Maybe you want to do that.